Hello, everybody, and welcome back um, for our final session of the day and uh, what a session it is going to be. So we've just been spending the last five minutes trying to get everybody lined up and sorted out. Um, but I have to say, I am so looking forward to this session, which is going to be all around uh, Gen, a Gen AI and the student experience. And we are going to have some students join us in just a minute. Um, but before they do, let me introduce um, our three panelists. Um, who are going to run the session. So that's going to give me a bit of a break. I'm going to sit back and enjoy. Um, now, these three um, are, I'm sure, not strangers to, to the group here at all. Um, first of all, we have Sue. Hi, Sue. Sue Beckingham, who's a principal lecturer and the LTA lead in computing. And in addition to teaching at both undergraduate and postgraduate level, she has an academic development leadership role where she provides support and guidance related to learning, teaching and assessment. And in 2017, she was awarded a National Teaching Fellowship. She's also a fellow and executive committee member of the Staff and Education Development Association. And we have Peter. Hi, Peter. Peter Hartley. Hello. Hi, has had a long career as an academic lecturer and professor of education development. He's now working as an independent consultant. He works on online learning materials while maintaining his profile in educational strategies and associated evaluations, research and publications. And then we have got Louise Drum. Hi, Louise. Great to see you. Louise is an associate professor in the Department of Learning and Teaching Enhancement at Edinburgh Napier University. She's a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy and a fellow of the Staff and Education Development Association. And you're all very welcome. And I am now going to hand over into your extremely capable hands. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for Sharon. Can we bring the students to the stage, please? That's wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to start off the proceedings by introducing the students. Um, this is a student panel, as you can see from the, the programme. So starting with Alex Walker from Sheffield Hallam University. He's undertaking a Master's in Finance. And then we have Frankie Wardale, who is a second year student and he's undertaking um, a degree in Psychology. We have Alejandra Rodrigo Sosa. She's a PhD student, third year in bioinformatics. And we have Amparo Gimene Rio, and she's a final year student and taking biomedical science. Unfortunately, our, our fifth student is, is unable to uh, attend, um, Mothio from the University of, of Kent, um, which is a shame. But uh, so we're going to start off the proceedings by um, asking Peter to explain this concept map. Peter is the king of concept maps. And let me just share my screen. This is a, a, a concept map that we've been using, Sue and I have been using for about six months now. Uh, we're both very heavily involved in the Education Development Association. And uh, so the context for this was when ChatGPT exploded, we thought that they needed to, education developers all across the UK needed to know what was happening with ChatGPT and generative AI. Uh, and so we ran a couple of uh, webinars for them and we then got various invites to go to universities uh, around the country and we're still getting invites to go and, and talk to folk about, about what's happening to this technology, how is it developing, what it's based on, and of course, covering a lot of things that have been talked about already this in today about the issues of bias and uh, hallucinations, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the slide we tend to use as our final po point of discussion. Where do we go from here? And we've used it as a point of discussion to get folk in the audience to say, well, how much is your institution doing to help people prepare for generative AI? Um, and if you look across that diagram, most organizations now that we have found, that we've talked to, are doing something about regulations and procedures, uh, often 
using things like the Russell Group uh, principles, etc. Um, most higher education institutions are doing something about professional development. Are they doing it for all staff, though? Question mark. Uh, because as all staff will be affected by this development, whether we like it or not. And have the institutions got the appropriate technical development and support? And we're not sure that they all have. Um, so institutions do seem to be working on the left-hand side of this diagram, but we think there's also real opportunities for institutions to spread out, uh, get involved in consultations, collaboration, co-creation towards the right-hand side of this diagram. Is there a collaborative sand pit? The idea of a sand pit, the idea of a development area where people can come together, academics from different areas, academics and students trying to collaborate because none of us really know where this technology is heading. So we're all kind of novices to some degree. Um, and what about student engagement? What are the institutional plans for student engagement? Uh, and as yet, I don't think we've hit an institution that's got all of these ducks in a row that's, that's hitting all these, these <laughs> buttons but things are changing you know in the, in the six months or so that we've been doing uh, these kind of webinars and what have you we've noticed obviously increasing numbers of staff getting involved increasing use of technology but on the other hand really chat gp chat gpt is a technology that most people have used not much perhaps experimentation around other solutions other possibilities and very little use of images, which we think is a bit sad because, as previously said in today, uh, stereotypes abound in generative AI, and we see it as a mechanism actually for unveiling some of those stereotypes, for actually getting staff and students to, to discuss them, uh, very much as the, uh, as the previous speaker, Tarson, was talking about in terms of the social work. So we think, see things are changing, but are they changing fast enough? We'll hand back to Sue and Louise. Thank you very much. So over to Louise, because what we want to um, begin to share through through both um, Louise's work and, and then on to our, our students, how we have been working in partnership with um, students. And whilst we've done a small amount, we still need to, to do more. So over to you, Louise. Thanks, Sue. Um, so I think one of the things that, that struck many of us, I suppose, um, in, during the last academic year was was perhaps the sort of absence of student voice um, in a lot of the discussions that were happening. And harking back to Helen's keynote this morning, her fantastic keynote, um, about, uh, I suppose, the decades of research in AI, but not just AI, education and, and AI. And, and I think one of the interesting things for me that has happened was all of the research previously, in my opinion, from what I found, has been very much about the institutions controlling the AI, this personalization idea, and uh, and the idea that this is uh, something that could be within a, a system that's in control, that we are in control of as, as institutions, and maybe as staff members of those institutions. But what happened was this: these tools got uh, thrown over the wall into the wild, and students uh, took it upon themselves to use them without our control. And I think that's something that's that's interesting. It's an interesting kind of take on on what has happened. I think over the past over the past year. So what we did at Edinburgh Napier University is we um, we set up an anonymous Padlet um, for students to tell us what they thought. Um, so, I mean, in terms of research methodology, it's not terribly complicated. You can see here what we are asking the students. Um, and the primary uh, kind of agenda behind this for me was that it was anonymous and that it was absolutely watertight, that students were assured that it was anonymous and there was no link because we didn't know what to expect in terms of people maybe um, uh, admitting certain things. Um, that QR code there, um, and I've got um, a link I can post as well, um, is is a link to all the resources about our um, um about our our uh, research project um a video that explains it a little bit more so i won't go into it in much detail here um uh, but we've run it twice now so we've done data collection in spring of last year and we did it um we just finished data collection from our autumn um tranche so um I just want to give you a little bit of an upshot update in terms of where we were maybe in spring and what might be the sort of sort of more nuanced stuff that's happening now. In the springtime, we had a lot of very positive responses from students, a lot of people 
saying that they were using it. I think there are limitations in our data. There will be people who didn't, don't use it and therefore didn't contribute to this or maybe did use it in maybe ways that may not have been 100% ethical but weren't prepared to admit that. But on the whole, most people were hugely um, positive about it and about its effectiveness. Um, they were looking at it in terms of having conversations with it, helping their understanding using as a dialogue partner and and most damning of all for us of course as they were saying it, we got fast responses in comparison to uh, talking to our tutors or emailing our, our lecturers uh, but there was a certain amount of awareness that there was limitations and and inaccuracies inaccuracies in it as well fast forward now to the past six weeks the kind of things that have been coming through is is quite interesting we've got and this links to some of the questions that came up in previous sessions. Some people are saying that actually, you know, I like the process of writing. I don't want my writing to be replaced. Um, some people are saying any use is cheating. So we're getting really di diverse kind of opinions now. And then other people think it should be used. And there's absolutely no question that it should be used and it should be part of education. Uh, consistent from last time round and this time round, helpful dis for disabled students, for neurodivergent students, massive, massive um, um, uh, uh, enthusiasm and um, as an assistive technology um, and also that idea that it expedites certain tasks like synthesizing and summarizing and searching. There were some quite plaintive posts about saying that it's not fair, I've done lots of work um, and interestingly some people concerned about outsourcing skills and um, maybe not talking about themselves but talking in the abstract about are we outsourcing critical thinking and is this helpful or is this limited so that's where we're at at the moment i'd encourage people to maybe follow the, the, that link that i posted if you have any questions please get in contact where uh, uh, our data set is open our methodology is open if people want to replicate this elsewhere um, but that's just a kind of a snapshot of where we are at the moment and this research was conducted conducted co-conducted with students as well and we are doing it this time as well and that's another thing that I would encourage getting that student voice into the actual research mm -hmm. itself is really helpful and that's all for me I'll pass back to Sue. Wonderful thank you very much and uh, we're actually taking up at Sheffield Hallam Louise's kind uh, offer generosity share sharing uh, all of this and, and we're going to be undertaking that in, in semester two and working with with students. So now to the exciting um, bits we're going to um, ask one by one our student panel to comment on their experience with generative AI and, and to maybe say something a little bit about their involvement with their own university in terms of um, any partnership activities that they've been involved in. So we're going to start, please, with Amparo. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, uh, yes. Um, hi, I'm Amparo, and I'm aiming to specialize in data science applied to neuroscience. And I started using AI tools at the same time. I started intensively studying data science on my own, uh, which is around two months ago, which is not so long. And I have been using different types of AI tools and uh, playing around, exploring what they could do and couldn't do for you. And in fact, um, I'm using them in my honors project and will be adding an attached, an attached file with the with a list of the AI tools I uh, have been using and how to show that um, these tools do not replace my responsibilities but rather they enhance my productivity and efficiency um, but focusing on generative AIs um, I use them for a wide variety of tasks uh, since English is not my first language um, I use them uh, to help me with any queries uh, regarding grammar or phrasing. And in turn, this also helps me uh, continue improving my English as well. Um, as a neurodivergent student, uh, for example, regarding reading papers is quite a difficult task for me since I struggle with my concentration and I misread words um, or not process what I'm reading properly. Uh, some days uh, this is just awful and <laughs> unbearable. Um, but summarizing, I realized that summarizing is part of the paper first with gener uh, generative AIs and then reading it uh, makes this task much easier for me since um, I guess is uh, that's because uh, what I'm reading is not new anymore, new information. 
Um, these, are, these are only two examples, but of course I use it in many other ways. Um, however, um, and I can't stress this enough, uh, you need to have a good understanding of the topic uh, you are using AI tools for, because generative AIs can't and won't do the job for you. And that's uh, more or less my experience. And uh, uh, later on, I will be happy to reply to any any questions you may have. Okay. Thank you, Amparo. That's that's wonderful. Could we have Alex Walker, please, next? Hi, everyone. My name is Alex, and so I've been using ChatGPT primarily from its inception. So I discovered it. I think it would have been well, probably a week into when it was launched by OpenAI. And since then, I'd say my experience has been quite thorough. So over the duration of the time, I pretty much use it as it's basically was replaced Quillbot for me. So I use it as a more advanced paraphraser, in my opinion, whereby I can feed it the inputs I out in a certain style of voice and get the desired output. And then more recently in March of this year, when GPT 4.0 is released, it's really helped me massively in terms of being able to program. So I started learning how to program last year and found that my progress was quite slow. It took me a long time getting familiar with um, different inputs in using the language R and Python. And using 4.0 has been a bit of a game changer, whereby now if I, my code's gone wrong, I can input it into ChatGPT, find out where I've gone wrong, make notes, and essentially now it eradicates the time that I was previously spending on quite menial tasks. And it means that my coding abilities become more proficient. But over the last year, I've really, there's been two main concerns that have sort of emerged for me and the main one being that within my faculty at university the information from lecturers and their opinions on chat gpt complete are completely different i've had some particularly within data science and analytics that believe that these tools are brilliant much as when google was first launched in the early 2000s like these tools are here and they're here to help you so you can use them and i've had others who seem that these things are the almost the creation of the devil and please do not use them. And if you do, you will be caught and there will be reprimand. So the, it's it's really overwhelming and you feel that you're, you know, it's like a moral question. Are you doing something that's that's wrong? And then the other one is that students aren't actually being taught how to use them. Mm. So 12 months ago when it was was first launched, I remember in my, I lived in quite a, a large household at university last year. And as each member essentially of my household would find out that what ChatGPT was and its capabilities. And I recall having one friend who showed me that it had written an entire essay for him. And he showed me that it's, it's great. It can, it can reference. And we sat down and looked through the references and all 25 of his references didn't exist. So that's the problem is students aren't being, aren't being taught to, to use these. And I think it's really important over the coming years that there is some sort of formal training, what shape or form that entails. I'm not too sure, but I definitely think that's really important right now. So I'll pass back to Sue and Peter. Thank you, Alex. Can we have Alejandra, please, next? OK, uh, can you hear me fine? Yes. Yes, OK. So my name is Alejandra. And as a PhD student in bioinformatics, I think I'm quite up to date with the latest advances made in AI, um, especially but not limited to the use of generative AIs uh, for both writing code and editing my texts. So in my personal experience um, as a computational researcher, uh, I have explored quite thoroughly multiple tools, being ChatGPT the first one I ever tested. Um, so my hopes when I started using it was to speed up my code writing. And more or less in the line of what Alex has mentioned, I've actually found that my code writing has been quite substantially been sped up uh, by the use of ChatGPT. Um, after that first use, I started exploring other more specific uh, AIs, such as what does this code do to perform some sort of reverse engineering and help me understand and clarify specific pieces of code that maybe I wasn't too sure about how they worked and whatnot. Um, I have also explored other generative AIs, such as perplexity AI and whatnot. Um, I found that they all have their advantages and their drawbacks, but that's, um, that's something that we can clarify later in the question, so why not? Um, now, the thing is that I have, after using these AIs, uh, I have arrived to a very straightforward conclusion. 
I believe that AIs in general are quite a very useful tool as long as you follow certain guidelines. So uh, probably someone has done that better than I have, but I believe that I, summar I can summarize this in three points. So the first one, in my opinion, is that as long as you can accurately work where your intentions are, you are specific, you are clear on what you're saying, uh, then you can actually use that tool to your advantage in a quite efficient way. Uh, now, the second point I would say is you can also find the appropriate tool for your purpose. Uh, I know that we're using mostly ChatGPT here in this in this webinar, but there's life beyond ChatGPT. There's many more AI tools. Um, so I believe that there's there's probably a right tool for for the right purpose. And the third point that I would mention is that you have to have the right expectations about what's going to be generated. Uh, some of my colleagues here have mentioned already, uh, you cannot expect the AI to do your whole job uh, for you. So maybe this might be true on certain levels, maybe on our first year of our undergrad, it might be a bit more true than on our fourth year. Uh, but definitely talking from a PhD, uh, third year PhD level, um, I can say that uh, AIs cannot do my job for me. Um, simple as that, uh, no matter how hard I tried, whenever I got too specific on my coding questions, the AI grew in increasingly confused to the point of repeating the exact same hallucination over and over. Um, however, it did sped up by at least a factor of two my code writing when I asked it to generate simple templates. And in a similar fashion as my colleague Amparo, um, I'm also not a native English speaker, and I found it quite useful to sometimes rephrase my sentences in a way that's a bit more suitable for English speaking instead of following a Spanish speaking grammar. Uh, that doesn't make much sense in English. Um, so the end bit of what I'm saying is that um, even though I'm, an, I'm, I'm I'm an alumni of Edinburgh Napier University, so I did my master's there. Currently, I am doing my PhD on the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, Dublin. And I have found that the policy of my university regarding AI is quite confusing. So on the one hand, they have a web page where they mention certain tools and certain guidelines on how to use and how to how to not use it. But then on the other hand, they fully mention, for example, if you're trying to use AIs for your PhD thesis, uh, they, they blatantly say out loud, no, you can't use them, that's it. Um, which is a bit, con it's, it's a bit confusing because you're providing some guidelines on one hand and then you're just saying an entirely different thing on a different session. So it would be great if we could achieve some sort of I don't know, standardization above all higher education universities. So that's, that's dreaming big, uh, but it would be great. <laughs> and that's all I have to say for now. Thank you very much for that. That was, that was great. And now over to you, Frankie, please. You, Are you, you muted, Frankie? Frankie? We're still not getting you, Frankie. Anything now? That's yes. It. yes. There we go, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Frankie. I am a undergraduate psychology student at Sheffield Hallam, uh, but I'm also part of the uh, university's student research team. So I'm currently leading a project on uh, student opinions on uh, the use of illicit, which is, if you're not familiar, it's a... Uh, a personal kind of research assistant so it will help summarize and find articles for you uh, it can summarize the the abstracts of the top four papers it finds um so we're looking at it's in the development phase and we're looking at using getting a, a small group of students to use it uh, in an assignment um which we will give proper guidance around so that they're not um punished for their for their involvement in the study and then we're going to uh, yeah get them to use it and then get their feedback and we're we're really looking into uh and really interested in how um how an ai tool might affect uh, a student's ability uh, key academic skills like especially with future development so um undergraduates don't have the same level of skills as a phd student or a master's student in terms of a, a literature review and a literature search so we're we're kind of concerned do do people like rely on these tools too much if they haven't already developed the skills because 
if you already have the skills, you can use it alongside, and it's a, it's a nice little interaction like that. But if you're starting out trying to learn something and you find a kind of easier way to do it or a, a less labor-intensive, less time-intensive way to do it, then uh, you might just rely on that and not develop your own skills. So we're really interested in doing that. I think it's a good points by all the others as well. A lot of people feel like it's cheating, especially especially a lot of people that I talk to, they, they don't know how they should use it. There's a lot of guidance from, from Sheffield Hallam, but it doesn't feel right, especially with most people looking at chat GPT. They think it's basically, it's kind of plagiarism because it's not your words. It's kind of the prompts and it's, it's just, there's a big gray area there, especially how, how people feel about it. So yeah, there's, there's definitely a, a lot to unpack in terms of does it affect students' abilities? Do people think it's cheating? Do people's like uh, opinions on it actually change how they use it as well? And, and would that disadvantage them? So I'll pass back to Sue. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. And Alex is also involved in a, a project, aren't you, working with the Learning Centre? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so essentially we've been, we did a research project over summer to have a look into how students are using or undergraduate students can use ChatGPT to structure an assignment. And again, it was looking at their iterative process from start to finish. And we found really that, again, one of the main, well, my main takeaways I mentioned was the issue of them not being trained and the problems with hallucinations. So again, a student had found some, they'd look for literature that they could use within their assignment. And they'd found that there were these, these 10 papers that they could reference. And again, you search the papers, and the papers don't exist they're not there so again i think that's something that that definitely needs to be addressed to some extent and that's actually forming um the research a uh, chapter in a book that peter and i are co-editing uh, with two other colleagues uh, about the use of generative ai in higher education that's a cedar routledge book that'll be coming out um early next next year mm. or spring spring of next year poss possibly so over to um to you the audience for some some questions i noticed there's there's one already from uh lucy caton she's the new lead for the center of ai in education at the university of bolton so you've got a big job job there there lucy but you're asking for recommendations on how would um you make uh, effectively manage lots of different collaborations and research projects with students um and across institutions it's a big, big question. Um, in terms of Sheff Sheffield Hallam, we've got the Student Engagement Evaluation Research Group. Uh, and each year we actually employ students as, as researchers, looking at lots of different things in relation to uh, learning and teaching uh, and assessment. But um, some of these have been linked to um, artificial intelligence or generative AI in particular. So, you know, having that pool, pool of students is, is one way. Um, another way is the, the, the funding. Each year we have some funding, small pots of money to um, give academics the opportunity to, to undertake some sort of research. Um, and we do encourage that with, with students so they can apply for, for that. So that's a couple of examples. Is there anything you'd like to add, uh, Louise or Peter, that you're aware of? Um, I think the only, the things that I'd add to that is is working with your student unions, um, and and indeed we uh, we do have a number of student um, consultants uh, that are employed uh, within the institution and students as partners as well. So any of the existing sort of student partnership schemes that you might have in existence already, um, and also the other thing I would just add is being. Um, just sort of advertise what you're doing and share what you're doing openly because you never know what sort of coincidences and serendipity would would bring us together. Amparo and Alejandra are two examples of that of two students who, who approached me uh, because they saw a poster about our research and and they've got a number of initiatives um, on, under underway already just because of that. So the more you share stuff, it's not that you need to organize and collaborate across the board with everybody, but if we set up networks where we're kind of uh, in contact with each other and uh, you know we're all kind of members of various networks and keeping in contact and sharing what's happening and um, i think that collaboration and cooperation is is key to this but we can't we can't organize it from from above it has to be quite grassroots level i think that uh, 
institutions that have already gone quite heavily into the students as change agents and co-creation are probably at an advantage here that if they make use of it uh, but again that notion of how these initiatives get permeated across the institution because i know institutions none i will not name where you know a really good a really solid in initiative never crosses the boundary between the between the departments um i was talking and that, that whole question of consistency between staff uh, and, and departments which has come out of the presentation so far is i think really important i was talking to a student the other day whose tutor was telling the students not to use chat gpt having just told them how they used it so that kind of element of oh, hypocrisy maybe uh, that's in the air we've got a problem that's just appeared in the chat from rosa sadler how aware do you think students are of the bias issues in AI tools? You folk obviously are, but are your colleagues? Hi, can I say something about yes. this? Uh, yes, about what uh, Rosa said. Um, from what I could hear from my peers, I think they are not very much aware of the bias issues as well as they are not very much aware of uh, characteristics uh, specific uh, from each AI tool. For example, I'm sure they don't know much about uh, chat GPT 3.5, not having access to internet or uh, being actualized only until 2021, mm. because um, I have heard them uh, wanting to use it for their assessments. and. Uh, I really think that uh, this is something that could be also added into a um, guide for students to know how to use the AI tools, like uh, what each um, AI tool can do for you, the characteristics of each of them, as well as the possible bias uh, you, you might find. Yeah. I mean, have, have any of your institutions really got gone that far to create a, a sort of general guide? Or do you know of any that really have cracked that? Actually, uh, and my colleague Alejandra and myself are working with Luis and the Department of Teaching and Learning uh, Enhancement, I think it was, uh, to uh, develop, uh, write a guide between mm -hmm. all of us for students and even teachers to use uh, mm. for AI tools. So watch this space, Louise, yeah? Yeah, just like trying to get our experiences as a student and uh, trying to shape them in a way that that might be useful for everyone at the university. Because in you, uh, Sarah Purcell in the, in the chat said, brilliant comment about needing to know your topic to make effective use of AI. And certainly that, in a sense, that's been my experience of getting to grips with this technology, is that the more you know about the topic, the better use you can make of chat GPT and all the search terms and stuff. Louise, do you want to say, comment on that? Um, and I, yes, because I think one of the things that I've encountered when um, uh, I've had staff who've been recently sort of introduced or experimented with uh, generative AI tools, it's because they're experts. Sometimes they go in and they and they put in a couple of prompts and what they get back is rubbish and they walk away going, oh, that's fine. That's nothing to worry about. Um, it's it's not any use to me, but it's probably not any use to my my students either. But they've got that expertise that kind of can see through um, the, the problems with it that maybe um, maybe students or, or uh, less expert users would not have. There's a, a really long comment in the chat from Mary Jacob about an opportunity to redesign learning. Uh, could we open Mary's mic and let her tell us herself? Is that possible? Didn't look like it. Just give us a yes. second. It will take me a minute to uh, give her the permission. So just give us one sec. OK, I'll, I'll start reading the, her comment on the chat. Opportunity to redesign learning to focus on task-based learning outcomes rather than content-based ones. So if a student should be able to carry out a task, it shifts the focus away from product towards process. This can help avoid the risks of using AI as a proxy for learning. What do the students on the panel think that this could change the, the, the teaching and the learning and the assessment? Mary, do you want to add to that? 
Yes, thank you very much, Peter. Um, I think this is, is possibly a really good opportunity for us to do that redesign, and especially if you can do, work with students as partners to redesign not just the assessment, but the whole uh, learning design of, of a module. So instead of turning to these tools to produce a, a thing that you then submit, but you didn't, maybe in some cases, students didn't really do the work or they didn't do much of the actual work, really a learning outcome is about what you can do in a meaningful way. So I'm able, you know, I'm able to write a computer programming a program of a certain type or something like that. And that might be using AI as a tool, but I, I have the knowledge to do it. I'm capable of doing this task. And that might help to demotivate people from using it in a way that might uh, bring academic integrity risks, um, but actually help them to develop for the workplace. So we're just wondering what the students in the panel, what you guys think, yeah. Frankie, do you want to kick off and then Alexander? Yeah, no, I think that I think that's a really good idea. I've always been massively in favor of like changing how you educate and how you test stuff to to teaching skills, teaching people how to do something instead of what it should look like when it's done, because you can then apply that and change it around in your own life and stuff. And I was diagnosed with ADHD quite late in my A levels, uh, which meant that all through, you know, school and stuff like that. The, the system just doesn't work for, for people like me and for a lot of people who don't have anything like they're, they're not neurodivergent or anything like that. It just doesn't quite work. You know, this whole system of it's, it's changed definitely at uni now, but GCSEs and A-levels in this country, they're all to do with memorization unless you do a coursework based mm -hmm. course. And those are really rare nowadays. So it's it doesn't really prepare you for what you need in life you know you don't get those critical thinking skills you don't get anything like that and you get those risks of okay you're looking to output something and you use a tool and it, it gives you the wrong thing and you don't know why you don't you don't challenge that you don't do hmm. do that sort of thing so yeah definitely all for more skills based learning instead of outcome based learning Alejandro Hi, so um, yes, of course, I also agree with what Frankie said. Uh, I'm also really all for um, skills learning instead of just outcome. And I think that uh, this is a concept that has already been implemented before. For example, whenever we had any kind of exam that was uh, open book exams or works that, well, back in the time when we started using internet in the uni in universities, um, I, I do still remember a time where, where using the internet as a resource to do your, your coursework or whatnot was still something that was still de being debated. Uh, so I, I do believe that this is kind of the natural flow of, <laughs> of AI tools. Um, because as, as it's also been stated previously, they, they are here to stay. I don't I don't see a way where we can just ban them out completely from university. Yeah. Um, I don't see how we can remove them. So I think that the best we can do is try and find a way to use them to our own advantage and also teach the students to, to use them adequately. So that's, that's my take on that. Yeah. Anybody else want to chip in on that, Alex? Uh, yeah, I would like Empower, to add something. And Alex, yeah. um, Yes, um, uh, besides of what uh, my colleague um, have said, I would also like to say that um, I think it, it would be really nice if assessments would focus more on providing you the tools and uh, the practice to check what you need to know or, or understand or learn new things, because I think uh, that's very important. And usually in most fields, in, if not all of them, um, what you know because you have studied for an exam at university will not uh, be sufficient mm -hmm. and uh, you will need to be open to learn new skills and to prepare for for them so i think uh, it's very important if we can learn at university how to do that and i think that uh, ai tools can be taught as a good way to support that new learning alex any comment yeah, in support of new learning, I'm completely in favour, say, in terms of like the programming that's been discussed, it would have taken me years to to get to where I am in terms of my proficiency. I, I simply couldn't have done it otherwise. The only mm. 
I wouldn't, I'd not got the access. I've not got, I've not got a close friend who can program to the level that I need to be able to now. So you've, you really have got that on hand personal assistant that's there 24 seven. So yeah, I'm absolutely all for it. Yeah. yeah. And I think if you look at the, some of the literature coming out of the organizational surveys of how many organizations are now, they may not be fully fledged in going to AI, but they're certainly dabbling with it. And so the more you, you know, before you get out onto the employment market about what this technology can do, and more importantly, what it cannot do, and what its limitations are, and how you can use it effectively, then, then the better. I'm not sure what time you have left, Sue. Do we need to check our watches? Sorry about that. I just had a coffee and fit. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, it, we finished finish at uh, 10 to. Okay, so we've got another five minutes. Um, just picking up on questions of bias have come up again in the in the chat. Um, the idea of user, I don't know whether uh, one comment there from uh, the bottom from Jason Williams, I enjoy debating topics with Google Bard. And I wonder whether any of you have used that kind of toing and froing as a, as a using a kind of study, one of the like Bard or one of the GPTs as a, as a kind of debating partner. Anybody? Yes, Ampala? I use, funny enough, I use uh, an, AI, an AI tool that's uh, mostly for fun. <laughs> That's all character AI. And oh, yeah. you can uh -huh. create your own character. And mm -hmm. I created a fictional classmate that knows more than I do about data science. So I usually debate with with uh, uh, with it uh, the ideas I may have about my horror project. And it keeps uh, suggesting me stuff I could do or uh, different alternatives in which I could test something. And most of it, it it's just garbage, <laughs> but, but some of them are actually useful. Uh, it uh, suggested me one time a call that I'm actually going to use on my Honors project. And again, you really need to know what you're talking about because you need to read that call. You need to think, OK, that, that makes sense. I need to check it. You need to check it on the appropriate website. And you need to understand the code. And, the arguments and if you have all the data you need and if you can make it work and then you can check and uh, you can test it on our studio and if it works then it's fine but still uh, it's very it's in a, it's a very fun way and also a very useful way to to have this kind of um uh, of peer partner <laughs> colleague that's an ai and and you can just discuss topics with it because even if it's just uh, suggesting stuff like that you need, you, you're like, mm, and that doesn't really make much sense. Even that way, uh, it can make you think of another way you, mm. you haven't thought before and say, okay, that doesn't make sense. But actually, this other thing that I could think about, thanks to that suggestion, suggestion that, that that's useful. Mm. And I think it's also a very interesting way to do uh, the learning uh, support. <laughs> yeah. I've also heard um, or read that you know it can be useful for interview practice. So you can put in the job description and the competencies, skills, etc., that are required, desired, and ask it to um, prompt you with some questions that might come up at interview. So you know having that practice, giving the scenarios for for your various different skills could could be helpful. And Louise, you've just put a comment in the chat, which gives us an academic reference for it. You want to talk about that for a minute? The zone of proximal development. Yeah, it's just that, that idea of the zone of proximal development of a, an idea of, of a kind of a, a more knowledgeable other being being the the way of kind of bringing your students' knowledge up to uh, a particular mm. level. So it's a quite a quite an old theory, but it's a it's a goodie. It gets rolled out, but it's just embodied exactly in that. If we're if uh, you know the the kind of relationship with the with the generative AI that you're using there, so so it's really good. And um, I wanted to kind of go back. There was a question in the chat. I wanted to uh, from Kathy. Um, I don't know if you missed it, Peter. It was uh, about um, what uh, what do what 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 do our colleagues here on the panel think about guides and training that students might need? What might that look like? Actually, that would be hmm. interesting to know about. Okay. Yeah, so what? What sort of training should you have? Uh, yeah, Frankie? I think, 
I think it'd be good to just any kind of training really because <laughs> the the guidance that is there at the moment especially if this is at Sheffield Hallam um it's very accessible but you need to go and find it you need to be the one that yeah. takes that initiative there's nothing in um we have adapt sessions which are academic development personal tuition there's nothing that's been mentioned in those about it or anything like that because that, that kind of seems like a, a perfect way to to talk about ai talk about its usage and kind of remind students of of the uh of the guidelines that the uni has and how to follow those to like properly um so i think just integrating it not even as a separate session or just putting it into the the things that are already there the familiar settings that students have is, mm. is probably a good way to do it so it's not something you have to go and find it's kind of shown shown mm. to students yeah and I think actually this the, the previous session from Tarson was a was a perfect example of how you could bring generative AI into a class session so that you both got the general lessons out and you got the kind of subject and it then moved into the kind of subject specialism and it got, it got university guidelines. I mean, a session like that on every course in the country would be a sort of real step forward, I would say. Any other thoughts? Thinking about open badges and you know, sort of, sort of mm, ready for yeah. doing something that's extra or co-curricular, I guess, really rather than extra co curricular. But um, yeah, trying trying to design it into a module for every single course is is possibly the ideal way, but um, comes with its challenges. And it also links to what uh, Catalina mentioned. Um, you know, staff are already. Um, really really busy overworked um etc when, when are they going to have time to um take up the training themselves or the trainings trainings produced um you know and it comes back to that allocation of time for staff development which you know everybody in any role um needs needs to embrace and, and undertake but you know how how can we best tackle this you know i've often said that it should be actually timetabled into our working weeks not not necessarily every week but there's an opportunity there so mm. that everybody has the opportunity to take part in it because quite often you know that again is self-directed uh, and i've quite often seen things oh that looks really interested but i'm already busy doing other other things because that time isn't spare um at a given point so a couple so. of other issues that just come up um one about uh are you a student worried about cheating with with AI it, from Louise's work? It doesn't seem to be that. It seems to me that's an issue there. But how important is it? And a second about uh, environmental impact, whether that's come out as an issue that students are worried about. Pick up either of those, if you would. In terms of the cheating dilemma, it seems to be a lot of the people that I've spoken to. It seems like a moral question of. A lot of people feel it's almost like superiority now in, in not using these things and and being able to to think i guess they said more critically than mm. than others so yeah it's um and say so what what determines ethical use again i'm not particularly sure so it's i think that's something that needs to be if there could be some sort of general consensus of that that would be fantastic but i mean that's almost an impossible question isn't it so yeah and I think we'll have to end there and I'll just just reiterate what Louisa said and, and others is to continue openly sharing the things that you're finding out because we're all learning, students are learning, staff are learning, uh, but together, you know, we share share this information, we can learn from, you know, what's what's not uh, going well, but also what is, is going well mm -hmm. and take that forward. So I'd like to thank everybody on on the panel um including our wonderful four students you've been incredible thank you uh, yeah. thank you very much for um participating and thank you to peter and louise as well and over back to you natalie thank you thank you so much that was a fantastic session um and i think it maybe highlights doesn't it that actually um, students are looking for guidance um, on how to use AI critically and ethically, but actually in some ways I think what we've heard from today's students is they're actually streets ahead of many of the lecturers that are teaching them, and that is one of the challenges that I think maybe we face. Um, I think today's been a fascinating 
series of presentations and I was struck by an image in Mary's session where she had that sort of tangled, looked like a tangled ball of string almost. And we've been looking today at the sort of ethical aspects of um, using artificial intelligence in, in teaching and learning. Um, and we've kind of taken different routes through that ball of string and different lenses on all of this. And the thing that I'm kind of left with is, can we find and can we develop sustainable approaches that actually bring staff and students together in partnership to sort of work our way and disentangle that, that ball of wool, as it were, um, and develop that kind of partnership working to develop guidance um, to maybe explore interdisciplinary learning to look at some of those ethical conundrums that AI throws up a bit like, you know, Tarsum was um, explaining in his case study. Um, and how can we develop scaffolding locally that's also contextual to the different disciplines because different disciplines bring different challenges. Um, and then how do we make sure that we support ethical and inclusive practice? So I think today's almost to me has been like the start of a conversation that we need to continue. Um, and there's almost that sense of we should come back next week and kind of carry on the conversation. But maybe that's something we need to look at how we facilitate that. But those are just my initial thoughts. Sharon, I don't know what your, your thoughts are. Thanks, Natalie. I was I was trying to sort of jot down a few notes from um, the absolutely fantastic sessions that we've had today um, and and quite apart from the the initial notion of, of principled refusal I suppose one thing that has really um, uh, made sense to me today I think is around um, just hope hope for the future um, and I think that that really shone through today and then as you said the need to have these spaces for conversations um, it, it came up in a number of different guises throughout the day. I think, you know, Helen was talking about conversations. We were talking about debate. We were talking about reflection. And then I think um, towards the end there, Louise put it very beautifully, talking about networks and collaborations. And and I think um, something that, that she said really um, meant something to me that it has to come from the grassroots um, and not from the top down. Um, so I think that was that was just lovely, and I think that those are the key messages that um, I'm going to take home with me. But I agree, we need to have more of these conversations, but not next week. I've got too much on. <laughs> no, absolutely, it's Christmas, isn't it? Yeah, but um, yeah, and just thank you everyone for coming along today, and thank you very much to all of our speakers. Um, I think the quality of the presentations today just absolutely superb and lots to really take away and reflect upon um and also lots of practical things that we can actually take and apply to our own practice which i think is always a real bonus isn't it to be able to come to something like today put time aside and think you actually can take things away and actually start to apply them in your own context so thank you very much and i also really want to thank um kerry and katie and the old team who've been working um, yeah. fearlessly in the background, trying to keep things going. And I know it's been maybe a little bit of a difficult day with the technology, but thank you, Kerry and Katie, for supporting us all and helping to make today happen. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, I, I have to say that I've, I've been so busy in the run up today that I, I really just rocked up. I'll be completely honest. I'm sure you could tell it, but um, but yeah, um, Kerry and and Katie and all the team working so hard behind the scenes. You're fab. Yeah. Thank you both, and thank you so much for co-chairing. And just to say that we'll be sending um, so the re recordings from today. You'll already find uh, a lot of them in the platform already. So on the main agenda page, if you scroll to the bottom to the section called media, you'll see that I think everybody's up to I think tarsums now uh, are in there and the rest will be made available um, shortly after maybe a bit of delay for the closed captions to be generated but they will um, appear eventually so do take a look at those and then um, any of the speakers that have shared resources or shared um, their presentations with us we'll send those on to everybody that's attended over the next couple of days um, so you'll get everything from today uh, shortly and later in this week um, so just from us and the alt team uh, a huge thank you to everyone for coming, to all of our fantastic speakers who, as Natalie and Sharon said, have done such a fantastic job today, and especially to our students this afternoon who uh, who did a fantastic job, uh, not only dealing with their own technical issues getting into the session,
but then also answering so many questions uh, and, and dealing with that so well. So thank you all so very much. Um, and that's it from us um, and uh, from the ALT team. And hopefully we'll see you in another ALT event very, very soon. Um, take care, everyone, and I shall disappear and allow Natalie and uh, Sharon to finish the day. Well, I'm... Oh. Oh, Sharon's disappeared. So just to say thank you very much again, everyone. Um, and keep an eye out for further events from ALT in the new year. Um, just a reminder too, to think about potential case studies that you might be able to submit to ALT around applying the ALT ethical framework. And again, there is the um, ALT award at the ALT C annual conference for um, the best um, case study around that. So get your thinking hats on and thinking about the work you're doing locally that you can maybe um, submit to that or just sharing those case studies. I think that's what we really relish, isn't it? The ability to see what our colleagues are doing in practice, what we can learn from that and how we can apply it to our own context. So thank you again. And with that, I'll pass to Sharon. So oh, I'm, I'm just going to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Christmas. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Take care. Bye. Bye.